This is Investing Ideas by ValueInvestAsia.com. All right, welcome to another episode of Investing Ideas. This、uh, week we have a very special guest, which is my co-founder Willie King. Hello, Willie. Hello. From ValueInvestAsia.com, this is Investing Ideas, where we talk to investors from all walks of life, learn from them, and find out some of their favorite investment ideas. Um, before before we even begin talking about your great idea for today, why don't、mm-hmm. you introduce yourself a little bit and、uh, you know more specific specifically what type of investors are you? Why don't you share with、uh, everyone your own investment style? Sure, thanks, Stanley. So, everyone, my name is Willie. I'm also a co-founder of Value Invest Asia.、Uh, my investment strategy is a lot on dividends. Uh, what I do is I like to buy stocks which are which have a very high dividend yield and they they pay out steady cash flow of、uh, dividend stream. So that's really largely my strategy. I look mostly in U.S., Hong Kong, and Singapore. So a, a lot of my stocks are dividend based stocks. So you can find myself, you can find me looking at sectors in financials,、uh, some industrial names. Reads some property names as well. So a little bit about myself.、Um, I currently run a consulting practice, an investment consulting practice, where I help、um, my clients,、uh, family offices, to make money through fixed income bond investments. I also help to set up their their operations as well. So it is a bit. It it sort of resonates with dividend yielding stocks because for bonds, it also creates a steady cash flow from their coupons. So as we all know that. Bonds are basically like your IOU.、Uh, you don't really get to participate in the upside of a bond, but you get that nice regular cash flow stream from the coupon payout. Usually paid out semi annually or quarterly. Right. Okay. Well, that's a、uh, that's a great a great introduction, and thank you so much. And、uh, you know, without further ado, I think let's、uh, dive in into your investment ideas for for today.、Uh, it's a very very interesting company, and I think not many people is actually looking at it.、Uh, although it's such a large cap company, why don't you introduce the company and let us know more about it? Yeah. Sure. So, for for today, what I want to introduce to you is a stock which I have, which is called Wells Fargo. Um, I believe if people have followed Warren Buffett and his portfolio, they will be very familiar. So Wells Fargo is one of the largest、um, commercial banks in the U.S. It has a market capitalization of more than slightly more than two hundred twenty two hundred billion U.S. dollar. It's listed on the New York Stock Exchange.、Um, currently, it has a dividend yield of about four point two percent, a price to earnings of. Ten and a half times, and a price to book of one point two seven times. So, a bit about Wells Fargo here.、Um, how I chanced upon this stock was because of the scandal、um, made、uh, one or two years back, where the bank itself was implicated in、uh, creating fraudulent checking and saving accounts. So there was a huge increase in the number of accounts being opened. But all these all these accounts are actually non-approved. They are unapproved by the customers of the bank. So as a result, there was actually a slight、uh, correction in 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 the stock itself. And I happened to chance upon it. I was looking at it, and this actually came across、um, my watch list,、right. and it's actually part of my portfolio right now.、Mm-hmm. Okay.、Uh, so you you bought it during the scandal.、Uh, you know,、um, can you just give a sense? Uh, how much has it appreciated since then?、Um, I think it has roughly increased, not much, about eight, nine, eight, nine percent, ten percent, like this. Okay, okay. Yeah. Still, still quite in a reasonable range. Okay, and、yeah. and it, this is a stock that you still like even today, right? Yes, of course. Okay, and can you go through? You know why? Why? Why is that the case? Okay. Um. So maybe before I get into the why, uh, I can just maybe talk about what Wells Fargo is.、Mm-hmm. Um. Wells Fargo, I, I think we all know it has roughly about、um, 1.9 trillion dollars in assets, and it's basically a commercial bank. Like I mentioned,、uh, it's very different from the other U.S. banks.
Mm-hmm. Wells Fargo is very focused in commercial banking, meaning that the very traditional savings and loans business, mm-hmm. where they take in deposits from the US population, the US citizens, and then they disperse their loans, be it for mortgages, be it for companies, for corporates, for SMEs. Right. So this is a very basic bread and butter business, which I kind of like when I look at financials. So it can simply be split up into various segments. Um, as you can see, they have consumer banking, wholesale banking, and they're also trying to go, go into digital banking these days. I mean, that's a lot of the trend for for the financial industry right now. Okay. Um, Wells Fargo also have um, wealth and investment management, mm-hmm. which is not as big a business, uh, even though it's a uh, it's a complementary to their commercial banking business. So largely, they are still very much in the wholesale consumer banking business where they lend out um, whatever deposits they have uh, to to their corporate clients, to their retail clients who are seeking for mortgages, who are looking at credit card mm-hmm. or auto loans. Right, so they are, they are truly the, the OCBC of, uh, of US, lah, kind of. Yeah. Oh, the DBS of US. Right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> DBS of, do, do DBS you, of US. Yeah. Do you have the breakdown as to like uh, how much of their revenue is coming from each segment? Just a rough idea because you say that the, the wealth and investment is still not a very big business for them. I guess in, in conjunction to, you know, other, other banks like uh, Goldman Sachs or, or, or JP Morgan. But uh, do you have a sense of what they are breakdown in, in segment? Yeah, I do. So as of 2018, so if I will give a full annual year picture, um, largely about 44% of their revenue, which is their interest and non-interest income combined, is 44%. So loans take up 44%. Um, another large part of their of their revenue income is also coming from what you call your debt security. So they actually make some investments as well, Mm -hmm. Uh, but that's not a very large portion of their pie. That's only about 14%. I see. Um, They also do a bit of trust, um, trust services as well. Um, That's another 14%. So a large, a large proportion of their, their banking business is still related to loans, as you can see Uh. from the chart. Okay, mm. okay. That's that's interesting. So they're still a more traditional bank in a sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that is uh, maybe not... That's why, in a sense, they are not too affected during the global financial crisis, right? Yeah, Compared exactly. The other banks. Yeah. Okay, okay. Exactly, exactly. And is this the main reason? Uh, I know you bought it during the crisis, but, uh, you know, it, it, is it uh, the bank that you, you you prefer over all the other American banks mainly because it is still a more traditional bank? Mm-hmm. So typically when I look out for banks in the US, um, I pay it more closely to what they are really doing. Mm-hmm. Um, banks in the US has two different spectrums. So maybe just to give a little flavor of it. Um, of it. So banking, you know, it's basically split in the US, is basically split either investment banking or commercial banking. So Wells Fargo happens to sit right at the spectrum of commercial banking. And they are sort of the king of the king in, when it comes to commercial banking. And if you compare to the other US banks, since the financial crisis or before the financial crisis, a lot of US banks, they started adding investment banking units to their business. Mm-hmm. And that creates a very lumpy or very volatile revenue business for them because what happens if let's say if there's a correction in the, in the financial markets investment banking activities will definitely drop but commercial banking tends to be very stable even though it might not be it might not sound as sexy as investment banks nor the fees which they can get from commercial banking might be very high mm-hmm. but it provides a very steady flow of the business right so think of for example your savings and loans when wells fargo or any other commercial banks lend out their, their, their money to, to finance a property, to finance mortgages, for example. Mm. The mortgage typically is set out or lent out over a very long period of time, say, for example, 25 years to 30 years. Mm. So that allows the bank to receive a steady income every year. Right. Okay. And that's something which I really look out for. Um, and Wells Fargo, you know, like I've mentioned, is the king of king in commercial banking, and that's the reason why I like to look at it. Uh, of course, when it comes to other investment banks, it's a different set of um, analysis which I, I employ myself. 
But for Wells Fargo in this case, what really strikes me out is it has a very dominant position in the US when it comes to deposits, when it comes to its loans. Right. Okay. And um, wh- why don't you, you, you mentioned a little bit about when you look at investment banks, uh, you use a different t- a lens to look at them. Why don't you share a little bit about about that? Um, wh- why why do you think investment bank is different? And maybe one or two things that you, you see them differently and how do you analyze an investment bank compared to a traditional com- co- consumer bank? Yeah, sure. So when it comes to investment banking, what I typically look out for is the relationship with some of the top companies. Say, for example, JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs, they happen to sit right at the top of the investment banking arena. So when we look at these two banks and we compare to the other investment banks in the US, uh, including the boutique investment banks, what, what you'll find is that these top of the top players, they typically have a very strong relationship with the companies, which they typically bring uh, these companies to the market. Uh, they often, they have this uh, intangible value or this franchise value where the relationship with the companies or with their clients are very strong. And on top of that, they also have that reputation. They are the reputation of being able to bring companies into the market through, say, for example, IPOs, through debt raising or M&A activities. Mm-hmm. So how I'll look at it, I mean, just to give a flavor is that these banks, you don't really need to have um, a strong network or a strong uh, branch network within the, the country. And on top of that, you don't really have a very strong deposit base. But what you do have is the relationship which you have with the companies. And you can see, you can see based on the annual report, you know, who, who they have worked with over the past years, you know, which which are the huge IPOs they are involved in, mm-hmm. um, which sectors they are very strong in. So when you see all the very high profile IPOs coming into the market, um, a good a good uh, telltale sign that the investment bank is good is that they always appear as one of the key underwriters right. for some of these IPOs. So this is, this is basically what I look out for for, for, for investment banks. Um, another thing is also their, their trading activities. Mm-hmm. That means um, these banks, they usually have a good complementary in terms of their trading segment. Mm-hmm. That means their market-making activities. Okay. So what happens, let's say if Goldman Sachs, they bring um, a company into IPO and post listing post ipo um they usually have the market makers to actually create market or create volume or liquidity for um their clients or to be able to generate uh volume mm. in the secondary market i see Ooh, oh interesting okay uh yeah why, why ne, ne, it's okay uh going back to wells fargo uh mm. you mentioned that it had a strong uh network and a good relationship with all its customers. Uh, how, how does that translate into its business? Or why, why do you like the business? Mm. I, I like Wiles Fargo because it has a very strong reputation. Um, it is actually one of the largest deposit holders in the US. Mm. Even though, you know, there's still that scandal. Um, the CEO also just resigned mm. um, because of that scandal itself. But even then, Wells Fargo has already established its name in the country. So it has very deep relationships with its retail customers. Um, it has a very reputable franchise. And because of this, it's able to provide this, what you call a flight to safety capability, meaning that, you know, in times of uh, financial stress, or if let's say there's a, if there's a bank run, mm. uh, what's going to happen is that depositors or the local population will definitely put money into the safest bank because in this period of time, it's not about how much interest rate or how much deposit rate they can stand to earn, but they definitely want to see their money being kept safe. Hmm. So that's where Wells Fargo actually really come in. And because of this, it, of its very large deposit base, it's able to expand itself in terms of the loans. So it gives the, the bank more firepower to increase their loans. It gives, gives the, the banks the capability or the advantage to capitalize on, on the large deposit base by charging a very low deposit rate. Because you don't really need to charge a very high deposit rate to attract depositors. Mm-hmm. Wells Fargo already has its own name. Mm-hmm. That's why depositors can just put in money or deposit the money into the bank itself without demanding a very high deposit rate. Right. And of course, for Wells Fargo, um, 
I mean, if we see in the US, it is still predominantly um, offline um, bank banking businesses. Mm -hmm. So they have the best or one of the best branch network in the US. So a lot of its uh, core group of business units, they typically also have very loyal, long-time customers. Ah, oh, cool. I, I guess, yeah. Um, you know, when you see at the US being such a big country, it, Wells Fargo being a, like almost a national bank, whereas uh, definitely have that stamp of uh, uh, as a more safe bank compared to maybe a, just a state state bank. Um, in the sense, uh, how, how does that translate to their business? You know, um, how, how has they been doing uh, after the financial crisis? Uh, can you give us, uh, you know, some some indication of how well they're doing right now? Yeah, I mean, if we can look on to the, the uh, next slide where we basically see the return on equity. Um, mm. So ROE is one of the measures which I use for banks. It is one of the easiest measure to calculate, uh, one of the easiest uh, indicators to calculate and typically you can find them either on the website, on their annual reports or some of the third party uh, research services mm -hmm. um, which have been provided. So you can see um, what I usually look out for for ROE, it's um, for banks, you know, you can either use ROA, which is written on assets or ROE, written on equity, shareholders equity. So I typically look at um, over the past, say, five to 10 years, and as long as the ROE is well above, say, 10% and hovering around 12%, I, I think this is a fairly decent indicator. I mean, coming from a company which have been around for a few centuries already. Mm -hmm. And you can see since 2010, just after Wells Fargo came out from the crisis, uh, it has started, the ROE has started to increase again from you know 10 plus percent all the way at one point was 14%. Mm. And then after that, it started to average out between 11 to 12% mm -hmm. in this case. So this is something which I draw a lot of comfort in. Um, many are times where when, when we look at banks, um, there tends to be a lot of numbers. They tends to be a lot of very technical terms mm. which we have to deal with or which we might not understand. But um, coming from myself, where I've been looking at financials for a very long time, um, I realized there are a lot of things, or a lot of ratios, which we don't really need to, to look at. Uh, we just have to pay attention to a very few key important criteria or few key important ratios, such as the ROE and the ROA. Then we can really get a sense of um, whether these banks are good, uh, whether they are strong, whether they are weak, whether they are growing well or not. So ROE is one indicator mm -hmm. which, which I'll look at. And this is something which I draw a lot of comfort in when we when, when I was looking at Wells Fargo. Right. Okay, okay. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's, why, why don't we discuss a little bit about the risk? You know, everything you, uh, you mentioned is quite rosy at the moment. <laughs> uh, the bank <laughs> is uh, doing very well and good ROE. Yeah. Um, but if I can be the devil's advocate, right? Uh, so mm -hmm. number one, I, I guess you assume that the crisis is just a one-off and you don't see any long-term impact for them. Why, why mm -hmm. do you think so? Mm. Um, so let's, let's talk about the crisis and also talk about the scandal itself. Mm. So for the crisis, um, back in the GFC, if you, if, if you were to track Wells Fargo um, all the way, you know, pre-crisis and even during 08 to 09, between this period, um, what you see is that even though that they have a uh, drop in their profitability, but they were able to rebound back really fast after the crisis. And they are one of the few banks where they didn't need to have a huge liquidity injection. What this means is that they don't have to knock on the government's door and say, hey, mm. I need to get some money from you guys. I do need to get a huge amount of money from you guys to maintain my business. Mm. Because um, for a simple fact is that a lot of their liabilities um, are mostly deposits means that they don't really have to borrow too much from other banks to finance their business. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm. So this is this this creates stability for them. Mm -hmm. um, that's why if you know if you are going forward, um, banks who typically which typically borrow a lot, they they tend to find themselves in need of cash during the crisis because during crisis. Uh, during crises, 
the amount of money or amount of capital which is available to companies or to the market typically gets redrawn back. Mm. So you have to rely, for banks, you really have to rely on your deposits. And on top of that, you have to ensure that the deposits don't deplete or don't decrease during this period. Okay. And, and, and also on the recent, most recent crisis on their reputation, um, mm. you don't see any impact on that as well. Do you? Mm. Um, I mean, if we look at it, Wells Fargo, uh, they, have, they have been talked about whether this, this fraudulent, fraudulent accounts will actually impact their bottom line. Um, and there were a lot of speculation saying that this could very well affect all the numbers which have been reported, you know, over the past five to seven years or even up to 10 years. Hmm. But if we see so far, you know, the scandal, since since the scandal was announced, um, it has been about close to two years, um, they've been fined about $180 million, which is not which is not really a huge amount with respect to the amount of assets which they hold. Hmm. And on top of that, uh, we have seen that their profitability, their, profitability, their earnings, um, and you can see, you know, just by observation from the day to day that their banking business is still very strong. Um, I mean, there have been some shakeup in the senior management themselves, but this is a business where you don't really need to rely on just one key man. Um, you know, if you have a very strong CEO or you have a very strong senior manager, mm-hmm. typically the bank is able to run um, by itself. And of course, because of the, the reputation that it has built over the years, mm. over several years, mm. um, this really creates that safety. It, it, it creates that comfort and that assurance in spite of the scandal. Okay, cool. Okay, mm. yeah, sure. That's, uh, that's good to know. Um, but what about some of the more um, macro risks, right? We, talk, we, we have seen reports saying that now the US uh, U curve has inverted. Uh, yeah. And also, there's a lot of disruption in the fintech area. Why don't we go f- uh, talking about the yield curve first? What, what is the inverted yield curve and why does it matter to a bank? Is it is it good or bad for a bank? Mm. So when it comes to an inverted yield curve, um, theoretically speaking, or you know, if you base on academics, what this means is that the, the interest rates, the long-term interest rates, that means uh, interest rates at which the mortgages or if there are any loans or if there are any debt which have, let's say, 15 years, 20 years, or 30 years in maturity, is actually priced lower than the short-term interest rate. And short-term interest rate could be your uh, federal fund rates. In Singapore, it could be your swap rate, you know, your one-year swap rate. It could be your, your, your US LIBOR or your CYBOR in Singapore's case. So... An inverted yield curve means that um, interest rates is actually much higher right now Mm -hmm. uh, in the short term. Let's let's say between um, a few months, it can be from a few months to one to three years. Okay. And the interest rates in the long term or the long end of of the yield curve, it's much lower than that. And what this means is that because banks, you know, there is this quote saying that, you know, they usually borrow short that means they, they they borrow from depositors the deposits and then they lend out these deposits in the form of loans in the long term. Hmm. So when you have an inverted yield curve, it just means that um, the interest rates which you are charging for companies is actually much lower than the deposits which you are being paid, which you are paying out to the, the depositors. Hmm. So theoretically, this is what it means and it isn't very good for the banks. Hmm. Um, however, you know, even though this might happen, mm. but the the mortgage rates or the interest rates the banks can charge, they can actually increase the credit risk or the credit risk pricing of some of these loans. Meaning that if, let's say, um, right now, the 10-year treasury is roughly at 2%, mm. it doesn't mean that Wells Fargo would be lending out their 10-year loans at 2%. They could be charging much higher. Say they can increase by another 0.5%, 0.7%, 1%, so and so forth, such that they are able to cover their cost of borrowing. And this cost of borrowing comes from paying the deposits, the depositors, the, the deposit, the uh, deposit rate. So in this case, uh, if banks are able to do it, 
they, they will still be able to ride through the inverted yield curve. Mm -hmm. And if we see, you know, during all the different crises, from if we track from the global financial crisis, the Asian financial crisis, the 1987 crisis, um, what precedes that crisis is usually an inverted yield curve, but the inverted yield curve is short-lived. So it typically lasts for maybe two to three years before the crisis hits. Then the yield curve will revert back to its original its 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 original shape. Right. Where it's yeah. Okay. So it will uninvert itself. Right. In this case. Uh, so. Mm -hmm. So it seems that uh, that's not good news, right? <laughs> for for my investors. <laughs> but, yeah. Um. I mean, I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't necessarily focus on the, the, the inversion of the yield curve just so because when we when we see ourselves as investors, we are typically looking long term. Mm. Especially for myself, I I am a pretty much uh, an income investor where I focus a lot on the dividends. Mm. So as much as I uh like everyone else when we look at some of the indicators. But moving the long term, um these are just temporary. Mm -hmm. uh, when I look at dividends, I typically look at the fundamental of the business, whether if it's affected by your yield curve or not. Because okay. I I feel that these are muchly these are mostly noises or distraction, which keeps us away from looking at the real thing, which is really looking at the underlying fundamentals of a business. Yep, uh, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, mm -hmm. th in the in the in the sense then, uh, you know, the yield curve might be just a temporary issue. But what about the technological disruption, uh, you know, the rise of fintech? Uh, we mm -hmm. see that very prominently, uh, like very dominantly, especially in China, that's happening. Um, I'm not very sure what's happening in the US, but um, can you share like what, what is Wells Cargo doing in this field? Uh, do you think that they, they will be all right? Mm. So when it comes to fintech um, in the US, for Wells Fargo specifically, what they are doing, it's more of a complementary. So people think that um, fintech it's like a direct hit on to compete against the banks. Hmm. But for Wells Fargo and a large part of the banks, they usually use it as a complement. What this means is that, for example, Wells Fargo is transitioning into online mortgage application. So rather than going to uh, one of the bank branches to apply for a mortgage, um, Wells Fargo is moving into online mortgage application. So, I mean, if compared to say, for example, when, when, when we apply mortgage in Singapore, we are, we are already doing it online, mm. but uh, you know, Wells Fargo is starting to catch up in this case. So they're using FinTech to be able to track some of these. Mm. Um, another thing is also the payments to improve their payment processes. So that's where FinTech really comes in. Uh, for example, when they, when they have their own credit cards, it's more facilitating the payment systems. So these are some of the things which um, Wells Fargo is capitalizing on the the revolution of the fintech right now, where they are they are really trying to look look at it. So I wouldn't really see fintech as much of a risk. Um, I would see it more as a more as a complement, and I find that the risk might uh, might be focused in the investment side of things, meaning in investment management or wealth management which Wells Fargo doesn't really have a huge exposure to. So don't forget, they still really, they still have, um, they still operate as a very traditional bread and butter commercial banking business, where they borrow from depositors and they just lend it out as loans. Okay, right, cool. Hmm. Okay, uh, fair. I'll, t I'll take that uh, argument. <laughs> uh, 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 then, okay, going back to uh, Wells Fargo, and I, I guess the most important thing is valuation. How do you value this company and wh why do you still think that it is attractive right now? Okay, um, so I bought this quite a while back. Um, right now, for in terms of the price to earnings, I find that this is actually relatively attractive. It's about 10, about 10, 11 times. Um, dividend yield is something which I still like. It's roughly about 4.2%. Um, this, this has actually increased compared to historically, they have been yielding about 2 to 3%. In terms of their dividend yield, so it has actually increased in the recent months. Um, of course, because of the scandal as well. Um, this is in spite of the relatively high price to book, um, which which is approximately one point 
1 1.2, 1 1.3 times book value. Uh, when I look for banks, I typically like it around one times price to book value or slightly lower. Um, this is uh, an exception which I make for Wells Fargo because I'm willing to pay a slight premium on its book value because I find that its franchise value is still unmatched. Um, it is still one of the largest commercial banking business and I would say it's the strongest, uh, or at least one of the strongest in the US. So this is something which I'm willing to pay for. And at, and at the same time, um, paying 4.17% dividend yield for this stock is something which is relatively, uh, it fits the strategy of my portfolio. And this is something which I'm happy to actually include in, in, in my portfolio. Okay, cool. Okay. Uh, but, you know, as investors, uh, we can invest anywhere in the world, right? We can invest any, anywhere in the world. And if I look at the, just on the valuation standpoint, uh, Wells Fargo looks interesting. But if you look at the Chinese banks, they are trading like 0 0.6, some are 0 0.5 plus times book value, and they are giving dividends around 6, 6%, 5, 6%. Uh, why do you still choose Wells Fargo over these Chinese banks? What's, what are your, some of your concerns? Mm. Uh, actually, I do own the Chinese banks as well. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, but okay. Um, but the reason why I want to share Wells Fargo is because um, I think at the end of the day, a US bank is still pretty much located in a developed market. Um, and these banks, they have survived crisis after crisis, especially for Wells Fargo. And there has to be a price tag for being able to to be able to survive for so long uh, versus the Chinese banks. Mm -hmm. um, the Chinese banks only came up, you know, over the past decade. They have been only listed in the past decade. So we 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 do know that they are that potentially they are actually one of the largest, if not even larger than some of the US banks. Um, but the track record of course cannot match to the US banks which have survived for so long. Um, on top of that, I also wish to point out that for Wells Fargo they have a very, very conservative loans to deposit ratio. Mm -hmm. So if we if we look at um, Wells Fargo itself, their loans to deposit ratio has, you know, over the past five, six years, has never exceeded um, 100%. What this means is that they don't lend out more than what they receive in terms of their deposits. So they are very conservative in this nature. It also means that they're able to increase their firepower for lending out. Um, their loans. Compared to a Chinese banks, uh, we also understand that the Chinese banks' loans to deposit also comes below 100%. But these are considered state banks, meaning that their loans to deposit ratio are actually tightly controlled by the state. So to, to, to improve their profitability, to increase their profitability, it's not as easy as compared to, say, Wells Fargo. And this is something which I, I do enjoy that flexibility, that ability to increase that firepower. Okay, wow, okay, fascinating. So you're, you're paying slightly pre uh, a premium price, but of course you are paying for quality as well. Uh, yeah. I absolutely love this idea and uh, definitely it will be a stock uh, added onto my watch list right now. Thank you so much again, uh, Willie, for sharing uh, this, yeah. this wonderful uh, stock with us. Uh, if you guys want to chat more with Willie regarding Wells Fargo or you just have some questions on, 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 on bonds or dividend stocks, he's the man to go to. Uh, you can email him at Willie at willieking.com. I'll provide his contact in the show notes below. And of course, you see that uh, he has a presentation uh, PDF for you guys. You'll be able to download that uh, on our show notes as well. I'll provide the link for you guys, guys down below. So thank you once again, Willie. I'll see you. Thank you. Soon. Thank you, Stan. Yeah, bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening. You can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. If you are feeling generous, please give us a rating and review as well. This would greatly help other investors find out about our podcast. To access our show notes, please go to valueinvestasia.com slash investing ideas. And be sure to sign up for our email newsletter for more outstanding content and reports about investing. The show is for entertainment purposes only and should not be taken as investment advice. Please seek professional advice or do your own research when making any investment decision.